I have been involved in uh, interviewing uh, for uh, about, uh, oh, 55 years, and oral history somewhat less than that. Uh, they're not entirely the same. Now, I owe my um, introduction to interviewing uh, to the uh, ups and downs of the uh, stock market. Uh, when I was in college, in my junior year, I got a job as an elevator operator uh, in the uh, stock exchange. Uh, this is the time of manual elevators, and uh, I uh, was the worst elevator operator you could imagine. Uh, people would need a stepladder to get out of the uh, compartment. Uh, I parted ways with the uh, stock exchange relatively quickly and looked for another job and came up with a uh, job with an individual by the name of Samuel Lubell, who was a political scientist, a journalist, and at that time a pollster um, who was competitive to the Harris Poll and the, the Gallup Poll. And uh, he had me starting off in the uh, New York metropolitan area, uh, interviewing people about uh, old Fords and Chevrolets and whether they prefer uh, six cylinders or eight cylinders, uh, turf builder for their grass, and the commercial uh, interviews paid for political interviews uh, that Lubell was doing. And this was 1958. And uh, uh, there was a Senate election coming up, and uh, there was a young man by the name of John Fitzgerald Kennedy uh, who was thinking of running for president in two more years. So I started off, I did the interviews, they worked out in the New York metropolitan area, and all of a sudden I found myself as a junior in college going around the country as a pollster, flying around. Uh, I went to uh, Little Rock uh, the uh, summer after the famous incident in 1957, uh, the desegregation uh, incident, and uh, I remember they were deciding whether to open the schools again, and uh, the uh, legislators were coming back to the Marion Hotel where I was staying uh, in their white suits, suspenders, straw hats, and I was witnessing a piece of history. Um, and then I went off to uh, uh, Dallas, Texas, and was talking to someone, and at that time when I was doing interviews, people were writing things down. This was pre-recording as far as I was concerned. And uh, uh, I'll never forget an individual uh, tearing the pad, the pad that I had away from my uh, uh, hands, ripping it up and sending me on my way. And uh, five years later, when the incident occurred in Dallas in November of uh, 1963, uh, I was not surprised that Dallas was the location of the assassination of the, the president. Well, I was at Columbia, and uh, being at Columbia studying uh, gave me an insight into the first oral history office that had been established in 1948 by a uh, uh, historian by the name of Alan Nevins. And Nevins had the idea of, uh, he would go out and do planned uh, recorded interviews uh, to generate source material for the writing of history. And the people that he would do it with were the, uh, the rich and the famous. And at that time when history was being written, it said that history was being written from the top down. It was being written about those people. It was being written about uh, presidents uh, and, uh, and kings and such. Uh, and there was a lot of information that was accumulated. Um, well, uh, he also felt that in doing the rich and famous elite interviewee, uh, interviewing, as we call it, uh, he uh, might get support, uh, financial support for what he was doing. So contract research was uh, in the back of his mind. Well, um, when I went off to do a uh, master's thesis, uh, I learned a very special lesson about interviewing and what would become important for uh, me in oral history. Uh, I did a uh, study of uh, Louis McHenry Howe, who was uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, assistant. Uh, and uh, I interviewed Eleanor Roosevelt, and I went to her townhouse uh, in New York City, 
And uh, I, here I was, a young student, and I made a mistake. I located an army base uh, that she went to uh, during the bonus march of 1933 uh, in the wrong place. And as soon as I did that, the interview went, fell apart. Uh, and uh, it was clear to me that, and I stress this in workshops when I'm talking to people about oral history, you must, must do background research and know a lot about what you're doing. Um, I used interviewing in writing a dissertation, and when I started teaching, which was way back, 100 years ago in 1965, uh, I uh, was approached by a, an electronic salesman who knew I was interested in this kind of work, and he had a little device. And that device, uh, he told me, was a strange thing. It was called a cassette recorder. And uh, I looked at it, and I thought, gee, this might be interesting to use. It was small. It was convenient. Um, and the next year, I went off to the Second National Colloquium of Oral History, the professional organization. It had just been started. Um, and here is this uh, young whippersnapper there. And show them the uh, cassette recorder. Uh, and uh, these uh, mature interviewers look at me and uh, look askance. How could you use that? Because they had been using 300-pound Bolin sack recorders, reel to reel. And it was really quite a thing if you had to carry this around to do an interview. Well, obviously, the cassette became the lingua franca of, uh, uh, of oral history. It made oral history easier to do. It made it more popular. And of course, in this day and age, uh, you're not carrying 300 pounds. You can do something, you know, carry something like this in your pocket, and you can record an interview on a digital uh, recorder. Um, and this has had implications because today oral history is becoming more oral, A-U-R-A-L, uh, than oral, O-R-A-L, because I had emphasized paper. You do an interview, you have a transcribe, goes into an archive in paper. And uh, a lot of the younger oral historians today will argue you don't have to do the transcripts uh, at all of the, uh, uh, of the interviews. Um, well, um, when I came to UConn, I was involved in a project uh, called, a, um, called the Peoples of Connecticut Project that de dealt with immigrants and ethnic groups. And as was suggested in the introduction, oral history is very good for talking to people who are not famous, not uh, those who have not left records. Uh, if you go to a presidential library, you have lots of records. If you want to uh, study the Cuban Missile Crisis, you go to Columbia Point, you go to the Kennedy Library, uh, you get all these papers together, and they're also oral histories. But for the average person, the average everyday life, it's not there. So oral history was very uh, well situated uh, for studying people who are not well known. I would say today, with the emphasis, particularly here at UConn, on human rights, I think many of the practitioners in uh, human rights uh, use interviews, because when you think about it, if you have human rights issues, there are governments that are suppressing individuals. And it's the government who has the official record, who is the one who is collecting all the material. And that's the story that's the official story. And to get the story of uh, the uh, other individuals, uh, obviously the victims, uh, it's best to go out and uh, talk to them. Now, uh, in uh, doing oral history, uh, it has certain psychological components to it. Uh, I spoke to uh, interviewing Holocaust survivors. For instance, uh, an individual is not a survivor in the uh, term of someone who was in the camps, but who got out of uh, Vienna, Austria in 1938. And uh, he was a teenager. And he was subject to anti-Semitism and beaten up frequently. And as he's talking to me uh, about that, he, uh, you can see his body. His body language closes up as he's talking. And there's a psychological effect here. And oral historians are not psychologists, or, or we're not trained as psychologists as psychiatrists. But trauma plays a role in what we do and uh, how we approach things. Um, another story, uh, a Jewish doctor in 1926 uh, told the story of how he had graduated from Yale Medical School and uh, uh, wanted to go on the faculty. 
uh, and he was told, we have our Jew. Um, and there was only room for one. And he told this story to an interviewer. Um, I was directing the project. That night, I get a phone call from him. He's all worried. He would never told this story before. Uh, and clearly, uh, for him, it was something that was bottled up. He had named the name of a dean. Uh, he didn't uh, like this uh, uh, happening very much. And uh, he was uh, worried and uh, concerned. And I said, look, it's part of history. It should be documented, uh, but it's up to you. Uh, are you comfortable with it? And he says he wants to think about it. And weeks pass, months pass. About 10 months later, I get a letter from Florida, he tells me. Uh, he's thought about it, it's okay to use. Now, obviously, this was a catharsis for the individual, and you see this coming in uh, oral history. Now, oral history also uh, has implications with respect to memory, because his historians for a long time said you should only trust written sources. And, you know, there's something to that. When I was writing the history of uh, Yukon, Red Brick and the Land of Steady Habits, I used oral history as one source. And uh, uh, it was primarily archival, the archives in the Dodd Center. And uh, I remember having uh, documents in front of me, and I was going to interview someone, and I said, gee, you were on this committee in 1968. I think it may have been the Faculty Standards Committee or something like that. And uh, the person looks at me and says, I was on that committee? And obviously, they didn't remember. I had the documents. Now, oral historians are very sensitive to uh, mistakes, silences, pauses, and all sorts of things uh, that happen when a person recounts oral history. Because if I'm talking to you about something that happened in 1970, and I make a, uh, I'm talking to you in 2013, so much has intervened between that, that it shapes your memory. And sometimes you are remembering what you remember, what you remember. So uh, what I would leave you with uh, in conclusion is that we understand this and that what oral history is, is really understanding the past from the perspective of the present. And if you keep that in mind, uh, you'll see what we do as oral historians. And I thank you very much.